This video, much like this book, is a story about education, what it really is, the shape that it's taken throughout history, and uh, what some of our modern misconceptions are about it. Um, this is a book that came into my life kind of ironically. Uh, in my early 20s, I took two good, honest runs at college, and uh, the first time it, I, I put it up on pause because it wasn't really working for my life at the time, and then the second time I ended up talking myself into dropping out. And this book had a lot to do with why, which was funny because uh, it was assigned to me by a professor in a 100-level English class, and it ended up, I wouldn't say that it went so, uh, wouldn't go so far as to say that it changed my life, but it ended up being massively impactful. In my lifetime, I haven't put together a you know top 10, best of all time list type thing for, for all the books that I've read. But if I did, this would be on it. Louis L'Amour is a man that I consider to be the great American novelist, even if no single book of his would stand up as the great American novel. I think the entire corpus of his works stands as a, as a tribute to his, his industry, his, his willingness to continue working, and his, his undying quest to always improve his craft, both on the, on the writing side and on the research side. Uh, he lived from 1908 to 1988. This book was published in 1989. He did write it himself. It, was, it is a, an autobiography. And it's not one of those that's necessarily about the technical side of writing, but more about, about how our lives influence our writing. I myself have wanted to be a writer since I was eight years old. We're, we're coming up on 30 years now for that. My third grade teacher got me started on it and I never looked back. And so even though I didn't really go to college to be a writer, I was thinking about getting into another trade, you know, one of the core classes being, you know, English and language. Uh, I'm glad that I got into it and I'm glad that this book was assigned to me. And uh, I'm just very, very grateful for the impact that it's had on me over the years. Um, there are 13 things that I've chosen to share with you from it today, uh, you know, as you'll see from the title of this video. And without further ado, let's get into them one by one. We're going to jump right into this old beat up battered copy that I got. You know, I had to go buy a whole bunch of books for school, so I went and got the cheapest ones that I possibly could off of Amazon. This one was 99 cents plus shipping. Um, so I, I dog-eared it, I marked it, I didn't much care about the condition of it at the time, but the more I worked through it, the more I found myself underlining passages of it and doing things that I never do, like dog-earing pages, because it's a cheap, good reference copy. I could go spend 25 bucks on a quality hardcover to have for my library, but I don't really want to. I, I, I like the experience that I had reading this copy and marking it up, and it makes it easy to refer back to and remember the things that I learned from it. Right here on page two, he says this, you can buy a fair beginning of an education in any bookstore with a good stock of paperback books for less than you would spend on a week's supply of gasoline. <laughs> I read this in 2007, 2008, and I said even especially today, and that's when gas was getting up over three, close to four dollars a gallon. Uh, a dollar in 1990 when this paperback was published is worth about two dollars today, but gas in 1990 was around a uh, buck fifteen national average. I, I googled all that, so it, it comes out to about the same. Um, you know, education in dollars is cheap. Um, you know, especially in the first world where we have access to an extensive written record of things that people before us have learned. the The real investment in it is your your time and your energy and your dedication to learning. One other thing that had significant relevance for me was his take on how to become a writer. He says, one is not by decision just a writer. One becomes a writer by writing, by shaping thoughts into the proper or improper words, depending on the subject, and by doing it constantly. There was so much I needed to learn that could only be learned by doing, by sitting down with a typewriter or a pen and simply writing. Most young writers waste at least three paragraphs and often three pages writing about their story rather than telling it. This was one of the many things I had yet to learn. And uh, I found myself relating to this kindred spirit as I read this because most of my early works, and, and I'm not just talking about the stuff that I wrote in my teens, I'm even talking about my, my very first book that I published right there, Rebel Heart. 
you know, kind of suffered from that. The, uh, the initial drafts of it really needed to be whittled down so that I could get to the story without talking about the story. Um, but more to the point, even if you're not a writer and you're watching this video, there's something to be learned there. You learn writing the same way that you learn anything else. It's only about 10% theory. You couldn't actually learn how to do something just by reading about it or even by watching a video on it. You would learn 90% of it by doing it with your hands, getting in there and actually learning it you know, through experience. Page 85, he shares with us our third bit of wisdom here, how to become, no, I lied, reasoning and why we suffer without it. There are two paragraphs here. He talks about why we should teach children uh, you know, reasoning faculties, things that we don't really emphasize so much in, in education today. He says, such instruction would be unthinkable in any country not a democracy. Namely, that you wouldn't teach reasoning to a country that wanted to uh, control its citizens through throttled information and such. And if carried out in a democracy, it might clear the air of a lot of loose thinking, loose public speaking, and the kind of questionable statements that fill the air during political and other campaigns. This man wrote this at a time when the U.S. presidents had very high approval ratings, you know, in the 80s and 90s. And, and even so, you know, he, he saw through all of that and realized that, you know, even if people like the president, that doesn't change the fact that political campaigns are, are largely, you know, buffoonery and bluster and they're performative. They're, they're not substantive and they're not reasonable. He says, the first generation of parents who had such children would have a difficult time, but would find their own thinking undergoing drastic change. Last week, I shared some thoughts with you from this book, the Thomas Jefferson Education that were very illuminating for me just as, as a parent uh, you know, and, and a teacher of my own children now, but also as, as a learner. You, you need to develop the faculties of reasoning, and that's not something that you can do entirely on your own. It, it comes from picking a good mentor, and for me to be a good mentor to my children, I have to learn how to do that myself. And, and uh, to the extent that I have at all in my life, it's largely been through reading good books and, and learning things that people before me have learned. Um, this, this faculty of reasoning is something that both major ideological camps in America lack. Um, this isn't uh, you know, the right wing jabbing at the left or vice versa. This is, this is the real line of demarcation is, is those who, who have reasonably thought out their positions on things and have even stress tested them and, and uh, you know, debated them with people who are on, say, the opposite side of an issue without, you know, taking things personally, understanding that you're debating a subject and not a person. It's, it's critical to the preservation of, of a republic uh, and the democratic method. Just a few pages later, this quote right here, my friend Shane has heard me say this to him a hundred times, adventure is nothing but a romantic name for trouble. He talks about how, uh, you know, when you're wandering through a desert, low on water, exhausted, tired, wondering when you're going to find civilization again and you're on the edge of death. That's not an adventure. That's actual trouble. It's not an adventure until you get back with your friends and you're comfortable and you're hydrated and you're telling the story. Um, Shane and I and our friend Eli, we went on a hike through Subway Canyon in the summer of 2008 and we kind of found ourselves in, in that situation. We started at the bottom of the trail. We hiked six miles up, had some fun, but you know, ran out of clean water. Uh, we started, you know, drinking stuff from the creek, which is borderline questionable, and wondering if we were going to find our way back to the trail. We were exhausted, didn't have any more food with us, and uh, I just remembered this line, adventure is nothing but a romantic name for trouble, and we were definitely in it. Gives you some interesting perspective. Also at the time, this is the next bit of wisdom, I was working at a bookstore. It was a small store owned by a small publisher, and so uh, oftentimes we would have to recommend the publisher's books on any given subject or in any given genre to the customers so that you know, we could help kind of keep the company af afloat. But this paragraph here stood out to me. It says, it is not uncommon today to find no one working in a bookstore who reads anything but the current bestsellers, if that much. In the days I speak of, bookstores were usually operated by book lovers. Now they are run by anyone, anyone who can ring up a sale. Yet there are exceptions, and to come upon them is always a pleasure. Uh, bookstores don't pay a whole lot in terms of wages. You know, even the one that I was at did a little bit better than the, the big chain bookstore next door. Um, 
but it was it was a pleasure of mine to be able to recommend books to people that they hadn't heard of, that most people hadn't heard of, that you know I was lucky to have stumbled upon in the first place because of the sheer volume of reading that I do, the amount of reading. You know, I'm, I'm still averaging 80, 90, 100 books a year, largely thank you to, uh, thanks to um, audiobooks, but I, I consume as much as I can because I, I like to think that I have something to gain from just about anything that I read. And if I get to a certain point in that book and don't learn anything, well, that's usually when I put it down because it's not, it's not filling the well, as it were. And again, just a few short pages later on 106, this is a point that Lamore repeats probably more than anything in this book. Writing is a learning process. One never knows enough and one is never good enough. This applies to us as human beings, not, you know, one is never good enough as, as a value judgment of our worth, but rather one is never skilled enough. You know, one can be proficient, but one, you, you never want to get to a point where you say, I'm good enough and I don't have to try to improve anymore at this thing. We should always be seeking to improve. Uh, my favorite football team, the Indianapolis Colts, have this saying to get 1% better every day. And, you know, we, we don't need to be making massive leaps and bounds every single time we progress, but if the focus is always on pushing that rock just a little bit more up the hill, then we know that we're always improving. We're, we're never going to get content. And if we try to get content, well, that rock's going to push us back down the hill. Page 120 has an interesting thought that, again, comes as a summation of uh, you know, the, the previous page. Uh, but he says right here, Someday men or some other intelligent creatures will stand on the sites of New York or Los Angeles and wonder if anyone ever lived there. I found Louis L'Amour's perspective on the world to be very interesting because of the amount of history that he'd consumed and the traveling that he'd done, you know, going all the way to the South Pacific, to Singapore. Um, he fought in World War II. Uh, there are some pictures of him in, in uniform here in the book. Uh, you know, he'd, he'd been around, he read a lot, he learned about the world through books and through firsthand experience. And he had a very, very long view of humanity and that helped him to put his day and age in context. And uh, I've, I've benefited from that perspective myself. Just a few pages later, takes us right here to uh, something that is, is again more applicable than not to writers, but you know, to any one of you in, in whatever your trade is. He's, he talks about, my secret was that no sooner did I put something in the mail than I wrote something else and sent it off. Each rejection was cushioned by my expectations for the other manuscripts. Too many writers put all their all, or excuse me, put their all into one script, and when it is rejected, they are devastated. This is kind of like having one dream to do one thing, or having one goal in life to accomplish one thing. Well, if you do it, then what? If you don't do it, then what? You know, have a backup plan. You know, us as writers, if we love one single story idea, that's great. But putting all that love into it and then having it fail, which it is most likely to do, at least in a commercial standpoint, but possibly also from an artistic standpoint, you know, you're, you're setting yourself up for utter devastation. Have a backup plan. Career-wise, I didn't have a backup plan. I thought I was going to go to college, and then I ended up working for my brother for a little while, and then when I really needed to get into a different situation, I thought, you know, I haven't really done my homework on anything else, and uh, <laughs> there's no chance that I'm going to get a six-figure book deal out of the blue, so I, I needed to have a backup plan, and that's how I ended up being a truck driver for the last eight years. And it's been great, but man alive, I wish I'd gotten into it sooner. Funnily enough, at work right now, I'm training a guy who's about 15 years younger than I am, who's been, he's been driving since he was 21, so he got his license right as quick as he could. And even though he's a high school dropout, much like Louis L'Amour, you know, he's, he's got his feet underneath himself. Uh, you know, when COVID hit last year, you know, he, he had a backup plan. He had money in the bank. He had, you know, other career options for himself that he was able to get into until the dust settled. You know, he's not suffering the way that many of his peers are in his age group. Louis L'Amour dropped out of school at age 15 because in his own words, what he told to his mother was that it was interfering with his education. You know, education and structured academia are not always the same thing. And we have a tendency in 21st century America to consider that, that to be exclusive. How you're only educated if you've gone to a formal school 
and you've gotten certified and the academics have told you that you're educated. Education is, is not just that rigorous, isolated structure that you pay somebody six figures for. It's much more than that. Uh, over here on page 140 uh, is another tidbit of wisdom that is broadly applicable. He quotes Gustave Flaubert and says, Talent is nothing but long patience. And then he adds to it this. The others all fell by the wayside, unable or unwilling to take rejection, and obviously incapable of that long patience of which Flaubert speaks. He's talking about other people that started to be writers around the same time that he did, but couldn't finish the journey. I have yet to write my magnum opus, and that goes both for writing as well as anything else in life. I have not yet experienced my hardest trials, and I have not yet accomplished my greatest success. Uh, you know, I, I know that that is always ahead of me, but I need to keep trying. I need to keep getting better, and I need to keep doing things greater than I have before. And that is where talent comes from. I consider myself to be a talented storyteller, and I am a pretty talented illustrator, but I know I'm not as good as I could be or as good as I want to be, and that's just going to come through practice and perseverance. 166. His take on books. Books are precious things, but more than that, they are the strong backbone of civilization. They are the thread upon which it all hangs, and they can save us when all else is lost. Going back again to last week's video, I talked about how we are the only species on earth that writes things down and hands it to the next generation. Um, you know, look at everything that I've got on my bookshelf here. These are just the classics, uh, you know, fiction, things like that. Over here on this shelf, which I'm not going to move the camera around and give you guys vertigo or anything like that, but I've got my historical books. I've got a lot of stuff that's you know, United States history. I've got a tome on Herodotus. I've got Clausewitz's tome on war. I've got a book on Rome and her enemies. Uh, these things are all just scratching the surface of the human story, and I have a great deal to learn from them. And once I get those things read and put behind me, I'll pick up another tome that fills in another, another blank and keep going. It is important to understand how the world got to be the way that it is today so that we can understand what the flaws are in it and how we can improve on it. And we all need to be learning and understanding these things for it to work, for it to get better. On page 198, he's got a, a take on the, not necessarily the industrial revolution, but industry and machinery comes into it. I believe that man has been living and is living in a Neanderthal state of mind. Mentally, we are still flaking rocks for scraping stones or chipping them for arrowheads. The life that lies before us will no longer permit such wastefulness or neglect. We are moving into outer space where the problems will be infinitely greater and will demand quicker, more accurate solutions. <laughs> Andy Weir, anyone? We cannot trust our destinies to machines alone. Man must make his own decisions. On my old podcast of the Brother Trucker Book Club, I reviewed a book called Wired for War. The author's name is escaping me at the moment, but he talks about how anytime you know, military uppers get into discussions about uh, artificially intelligent systems, they usually shoot that down because they say, we want to keep humans in the loop. We want to automate the labor process, but we don't want to relegate the command process to a system that makes the decisions in lieu of ourselves. And what we don't often see is that the connection between decision making and labor is very, very strong. Um, you know, even if we, what's the right word here, subsidize or supplement rather our labor with machine help, we still need to be putting the brain power in. We still need to be the ones making the decision and doing the learning. Because, you know, as the Titans did with the gods and as the gods did with mankind, and as now mankind is trying to do with machinery, the thing that you create to replace your labor and your thinking will eventually replace you because that is what we are and that is what we do. 2.14. Um, this again comes back to uh, something that I've touched on before and again, um, that coworker that I told you about, he's, he's 22 years old and when he was 10, he was reading on a 12th grade level. So fifth grade reading on a 12th grade level. But he said that later reading assignments in school just kind of beat the love of reading out of him and he hasn't really read anything for fun since then. He's an intelligent guy, like I said, he's got his feet under him and he's got his life together and uh, you know, I find that admirable and respectable. Um, you know, but 
public school kind of fails in, in, in often instilling that love of reading. Lemoore's take on that, his advice is to say, for those who have not been readers, read what entertains you. Reading is fun. Reading is adventure. It is not important what you read at first, only that you read. If I could pan back and show you my entire library here, you would see that most of it is fiction. But the lion's share of my reading over the last several years has moved over to nonfiction. And about a decade ago, I had a, a, a somewhat jovial conversation with my older brother, the PhD, because uh, I was reading a lot of epic fantasy and he was reading books on like the history of salt or whatever. And I, uh, I couldn't imagine how that would be fascinating, blah, blah, blah. And we were going at it. And now here I am on YouTube doing nonfiction videos about history and, and uh, I, I get it. But I wouldn't have gotten into reading nonfiction if I didn't first have a love of reading in general. And that came from reading fiction, reading things that tickled my imagination and put me into these fictional, fantastical worlds. From there, the gap was kind of bridged by a desire to understand what is fantastical in our own world. And you find that out by reading history and by reading nonfiction. So start reading at first what you like and the love of reading will come. And finally, at the end, before he gets into all the appendices, he talks about, as a kind of a closing shot here on page 234, this. The world in which I have lived has often been a harsh, bitter one, but it has always been tinged with romance. I doubt I could have endured the one without the other. That is, for my two cents, that is, uh, you know, what what soul is all about. You know, we, we humankind, or we, we human creatures, excuse me, we're not just these cold, calculating, sticky protein-based robots that, that do things on a, on a technical level and that's it. You know, we, we have souls inside us and those need to be fed by things just as much as we need to feed our bodies with food. Um, you know, you, you need to find beauty, you need to find meaning, you need to find substance. And that's going to take a different shape for different people. You know, I myself have, have my faith. I understand that not everybody's big on religion. Other people get into philosophy. There are even, uh, you know, atheists I've had conversations with who, who've had you know, very interesting takes and perspectives on things that, that I have benefited from intellectually. Um, I think what matters more is that we find beauty and we respect each other in the process. And this is not a perspective that I would have had without my own experiences as a, as a wandering man. Uh, I myself have not wandered as far as Louis L'Amour did, and I certainly have not lived through as difficult times as he has, at least not yet. Taking a look at the world around us, um, you know, in 21st century America, who knows, things might get spicy and might get really interesting here real soon, even more so than they already have. But for me, you know, my, I don't want to say coping mechanism, because I feel like that kind of reduces it, but... My way of, of working through the difficult side of life is, is tied up in finding meaning in it all, finding beauty and finding intrigue, finding, finding that substance there. So I would recommend this book to anyone and everyone. Uh, it's a clean read. Lamore is a clean writer. And uh, his most fascinating story, and I've read about a dozen of his books, is definitely his own. Um, and I'm very, very grateful. I wish I knew what the professor's name was that assigned me this, but I'm grateful that this book was assigned to me and I'm grateful that I took a swing at college so that I could find it. I don't know that I would have otherwise, but go pick up a copy from your library, go get a cheap one off of Amazon or what have you and, uh, and give it a look. By all means, let me know what you think. And uh, until then, drive safe. See you guys out there.